that was excellent. Um, carrying on further, um, our next segment, we're going to talk about the future of virtual reality. Uh, VR is brought in, has brought in a revolution in the realm of entertainment and education. With the progression in its technology, VR is being adapted by multiple industries. With the help of this session, our keynote speaker is going to take you through the entire gamut of business solutions provided by VR across industries. Please welcome up Mr. Badal Dixit, founder of Pearl Quest Interactive. Good afternoon, everyone. So this is the last session before the lunch, and I've been informed by the organizers that whoever leaves the room won't be served lunch. So it's your choice. <laughs> All right, so uh, today I'm going to talk about virtual reality. Uh, there are many misconceptions. There are many confusions about uh, the technology, about the industry. So I'll try my best to cover as much as possible in terms of what's out there. And uh, here's a small uh, preview of what's going to happen. We're going to cover some quick facts. Uh, I'm going to tell you about how VR or XR in, in general is a computing revolution. Uh, the novel usage in various industries like healthcare, retail, immersive art, automotive, how uh, AR and VR are redefining workspaces, the way you work, the way you use computers, and also what's next. And if we get time and if you're not too hungry, then we'll open up to some questions. So um, before I tell you a little bit on the facts and figures, let's define XR. Now, there's a confusion whether XR is cross-reality or is it extended reality. Now, XR was a term or an acronym formed three years ago at the uh, Augmented World Expo in Silicon Valley, where they said that, you know, let's not get confused about what VR is, what AR is, and what mixed reality is. Let's just call it XR, which is extended reality. X stands for anything where you are changing the user's reality. And uh, later, of course, with integration of actuators, sensors, uh, with other haptic devices, they also called it cross-reality, where AR, VR, MR integrate with IoT, with other sensors and devices. So let's look at this quick snapshot. Total investments till date have been $143 billion, which is great, which is like any emerging tech sector. Just in 2016, the market size was only $2 billion. It was only $2 billion, but what's estimated and the way it's growing, the way it's projected, in 2022, it's, by 2022, we are talking of uh, exponential growth of $571 billion, which is unbelievable, which is probably a world record in any other industry which is shaping up so fast. So there's enough opportunities there. There are some amazing... Uh, technologies which are coming up in this in this field. Um, some stats here, 14 million AR and VR devices, which are actually expected to be sold this year itself. More than 171 VR users, I'm not even talking about AR and other tech, tech here, 171 million VR users. The demand for standalone VR headsets uh, will grow over 16 times. That's what the industry experts are saying. And uh, for the rich people out here, I know there are a few of them here, uh, the best VR stocks to buy are Facebook, Sony, and some gaming companies like Electronic Arts. So those are the hot ones to invest in right now. Uh, in terms of employment, over four, like this, I made this presentation just day before yesterday, and I looked up uh, what's the current figures here. 493 open jobs in Oculus. Uh, AR, VR jobs on LinkedIn are four times since 2016. Uh, other top employers are Google, Microsoft, and Intel. Indeed.com, if you open up right now, you'll see there are great entry and senior level positions, which are quite a few in number. And uh, you know, you even have 841, $95,000 jobs. So like we are top level execs are being employed in the VR industry. So it is promising. I would say that those figures tell you a lot. Now let's talk about IoT. Everyone is talking about IoT. IoT is the big brother, uh, you could say. 
it's a disruptor where they are saying 50.1 billion devices by 2020. The journey of IoT, the way you've seen it was established with Inception in 2009, and by 2020, it's, it's kind of uh, like that's the shape of the graph. But if you compare it to XR, it's going to be exponential. It's going to be following a similar pattern or even a better pattern in terms of adoption, in terms of how new startups come up and in, you know, create these uh, technologies within that space. So it is going to be the next big disruptor, as per uh, some experts there. Now, let me talk a bit about how it is a computing revolution. Uh, everyone is glued to their smartphones. There are a lot of people glued to their smartphones now, like every, every time. My, the thing is, why are we using devices which are in our hand? Why are we using devices where you have to type using a keyboard? When, like this, the guy wearing this is, uh, is the Microsoft HoloLens 1. They are launching the HoloLens 2, which is almost in pre-order stage now. It is almost a super, I mean, let's not call it a supercomputer, but a, a really powerful computer on your head and very lightweight. It can pretty much do what a great computer would do five years back. And it has a display inbuilt. It has the UI, which becomes a part of your reality. And it's going to redefine how you use computers. So it is definitely a computing revolution. And let me illustrate this by a few more things. There, headsets have evolved. If you see uh, the Vive Focus and the Oculus Quest, these are standalone headsets in the range of five to $600. So normal consumers can easily afford these headsets and that, that price point is gonna go much lesser soon. Uh, but the, the great thing is if, you, if any of you have tried these headsets, the clarity and the, the resolution is great. It, like if you play games or if you test out any of the mainstream apps, you will feel this is it. I mean, wh what else do you need in VR? You don't need those bulky, huge headsets. But having said that, if you look at Xtal, Xtal is a $6,000 headset. And uh, it's, of course, used for really mainstream, uh, you know, architectural use or very exclusive applications, but each eye resolution is 2.5K. So it's a 5K, uh, you know, in terms of the visual clarity. Uh, if you wear this headset, you're like immersed into any reality you want. You won't feel the difference. Uh, same with Vive Cosmos, HTC Vive, the ones who've tried HTC Vive Pro in the audience, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's amazing, it's really amazing. But now Vive Cosmos has been launched. It's again at the pre-order and that is gonna be wireless. So you can roam around a particular area. You don't really have to have those wires connected with extreme fidelity and clarity. So headsets have definitely evolved. In terms of content, there is a revolution we are looking at in video capture. There are uh, different types of 360 cameras which are consumer level now, which are available in retail stores like the Samsung Gear, like the Ricoh Theta. These are the normal cameras which record in 4K in 360 and you can just publish it over YouTube or any other uh, streaming platform. So user-generated content, the way you used to have it with 2D smartphones or cameras, that's happening in 360 today. At the same time, platforms like Facebook 360, Project Beyond, or YouTube is now supporting 8K 360 videos. At the same time, there are commercial grade or professional grade video rigs. So uh, the, the one which you see there, that huge round one, that's the Jaunt VR, heads, uh, VR rig, which can record concerts or sports shows in extreme clarity and resolution and stream them live on various platforms. So content creation in virtual reality itself has gone to a great stage now. Uh, that, that's great. In terms of user input, New technologies like eye tracking. Now imagine uh, there are eye trackers within the headset. The way you perceive virtual reality when you wear the headset, and if the system knows where you're looking at, you can imagine what kind of content can interact with the user. Because when your eyes are being tracked, it is like reality. Because in reality, when I look at someone, he looks back at me, and if the system knows it, Eye tracking will create the experiences to the next level. Same way with positional tracking, positional trackers are being embedded into the VR headsets. So it's very easy for the system to know where the user is moving, what is he doing, how, how, how the head is turning. So that creates a next level of immersion. 
movement, um, my own company, Pearl Quest, we are doing some work in the movement stream. We have created VR cycles. We have created some VR gear for fitness. But the same way, there are VR treadmills. Now, this was a great example for games where you can walk into the virtual world on the treadmill. You don't realize that you are actually walking on the same spot. Our uh, science fiction fans know about what I'm talking about with uh, Ready Player One and other. But imagine movement for a 360 real estate experience, that I'm walking through a space where I know, you know, this is where the wall is, this is where the other room is. So I can create simulations or training packages uh, with integration of movement. At the same time, haptics and wearables, uh, more accurate haptic feedback, force feedback on gloves, on body suits, haptic, uh, uh, you know, harnesses, where you feel not only you are a in your visual sense is totally uh, embraced with it, but even your physical sense. So you feel what you're doing in virtual reality. That's the great uh, next step. Also, there has been a revolution in the engines to create content. Earlier, if you all, I mean, some of you might know that was only Unity and Unreal Engine, which are the top contenders when it comes to creating VR content. But now there is Cry Engine, which is very designer focused than developer focused. So even designers with limited programming knowledge can start creating in depth uh, VR content or even AR content. Uh, uh, this is a new uh, beta launched by Amazon called the Lumberyard Project, uh, the, which is which is a free, it, it's a free source package. If all you need is an AWS account, and you can start creating virtual experiences, which uh, just, uh, which have assets, and which have a lot of 3D content, which can be taken directly from the repository, and you can create these experiences uh, very easily, without getting too much into the code, and making it very easily possible for all countries, all types of people. Uh, at the same time, as you all know, VR is being used a lot in training and simulation, in uh, learning environments. Now, Adobe Captivate 2019 is letting you create training programs very easily adaptable to VR headsets. So the way it was becoming a very programming-centric approach, now it's becoming a designer-centric approach, so more content can be produced easily. Now, uh, let me just... Uh, show you a few case studies rather than getting too much into the technology and again bore you and uh, make you run for lunch. I will uh, show you some case studies uh, where in different sectors how VR is getting penetrated. Let's talk about healthcare. We have a live example here, Mr. Bilal already, uh, his case for VR to be used in psychology. There are 900 million, uh, there's a 900 million, million valuation for healthcare market alone and it's predicted to be three billion by 2023. So healthcare, I would say, is the number one market right now, apart from real estate training and games and entertainment. So uh, let's talk about this project. This is called VR Alfred. VR Alfred is a project which is aimed at prospective healthcare professionals. So this example is shown to students in the university, and they see uh, Embodied Labs has made this for students where when they wear the headset, they see the world as this guy, 73-year-old guy called Alfred, uh, who's suffering from macular degeneration and hearing loss. But when you wear the headset, you start looking at the world the way Alfred would look at it. Now, this is with a single aim, that when I see the world like a patient, there is a different sense of empathy uh, in me, and I am more geared up to assistive care, to health care, uh, to nursing and, and the, the domains which require more empathy than just knowledge. So that's where this project is aimed at and has been very successful. Uh, Florio is another startup based in the US which is doing work in, uh, for autistics, like for, for uh, people uh, suffering from autism and they have a lot of problems with social skills and communication skills. So these interactive games are focused at autistic children and autistic youngsters to make their communication skills in line with how the normal world would operate with them. And only VR could cap capture that because as, a, as someone who's not autistic, there is no way you can understand how they are looking at the world. So this kind of aligns them with the real world. And it's, it's again, a very successful venture. Uh, VR Health is a, is a suite of applications where uh, 
simple things like physiotherapy, like uh, uh, rehabilitation. There are these interactive experiences made in, in VR, which healthcare professionals can employ. And what happens is, as the patient is going through these games, there is a lot of analytical data which is being saved. And the, it's, it's very good predictive analysis for uh, the doctors to know what are the next steps for that particular patient. So if my shoulder has a problem, I do these exercises in VR because it's more immersive, more engaging. So when I get these exercises done, uh, essentially what happens is the doctors know very well that whether this per person is on track, whether this patient needs more care, and there's all data to support it. So XR Health has a brilliant suite of applications any healthcare professional can use. Uh, surgical theater, this, uh, this was a revolution almost two years back for brain surgeons, where they could dive deep into the brain chemistry, the, the actual brain details where they could see if there are tumors. Now, instead of doing this on a monitor, just imagine on a 2D surface, if I can delve into the 3D dynamic movement of the insides, now you know how complex the organ is. Now, when doctors could or surgeons could go through it, they could even walk their patients through where the problem is. So it, it's a next generation of uh, patient education as well as for surgeons to make the best use of it. There's some other interesting examples. A deep VR is a meditative virtual reality game for people with uh, anxiety or other nervous breakdowns and other psychological issues where the, the experience is controlled by the breathing, where breathing is very important. It's, it's based on ancient yoga practices where uh, you are supposed to breathe in, in some rhythm. The 3D environment adapts itself with the way you breathe. So if I'm breathing in the correct rhythm, the environment will change. If I'm breathing very fast, then the environment will tell me. Uh, imagine in your real world, if you're breathing really fast, if you're nervous, and things start changing around you, and ma which make you come back to normal. So there are unlimited possibilities. I mean, this, I hope this is opening up your imagination. Uh, the, another very interesting case study with dental pain, uh, I'm sure there are very, I think Bilal needs to work on phobias with dentists also. Like I used to be a dentophobic, I don't know if that's the right word, but there are people who are scared of dentists. This case study where they used a Sony PlayStation VR game and they just showed some beautiful sceneries while the root canal or some other operation on the tooth was being done. When uh, there was a proper A-B testing done, when people were shown this 360 scenery, and operated on their tooth versus normally, there was I think some 70, 60 to 70 percent uh, distinction between the pain they were experiencing because your mind, your brain is totally engaged in a different scenario. So you see there are tremendous possibilities in healthcare. Let's talk about retail, which is a huge B2C offering uh, and, and, and that's where the money is, not in Dubai for now, but sooner or later uh, in, in, in this region too. Uh, but retail needs innovation. Retail is not doing so well in, in other parts of the world. But 70% of the customers admitted that they strongly were interested in virtual shopping. And 65% wanted a more extensive uh, you know, contextual information about the products. Because if I just walk in somewhere and if I see a product, uh, that's not enough. I need more information. I need testimonials. I usually look it up on my phone. but. Uh, that's where XR helps. Now, IKEA Place, you, you already know about the IKEA's AR app, where yesterday people, there was a panel talking about it where you could position furniture inside your house, but even IKEA Place has a VR application. You can visualize complete rooms with the furniture which you're looking at or the furniture which you anticipate to buy. So IKEA Place was a successful case study. Alibaba, um, did a slightly different thing and Amazon later just copied it. But uh, Alibaba's VR experiment uh, two years back was again to, to use contextual VR. So in, in the real world environment, like it, in a retail store, I want the items to show up more information like I would see on an e-commerce site. Rather than just going and picking an item through VR interfaces, I, I not only see what I'm supposed to buy, but I see more information which is contextual. So that was also a successful case and they are still working on uh, making this mainstream. Uh, Obsess is, is a startup based out of New York. Uh, I know them very well if, if in case anyone wants to connect, uh, I can connect them. This, this is a great tool for existing e-commerce solutions. Obsess makes a clone of the real store, 
and not only through your mobile device, but even through uh, a virtual reality device, you can browse stores, you can pick an item which you want and just buy it sitting in, at your house or sitting in, in your office. So this is how the, like what they've done is they've made these 360 panoramas of different stores like Tommy, like you know, of there's so many different case, uh, like clients they have. And essentially, it, it lets you browse the store the same way you would do in real life, choose the product which you want and just go ahead and buy it. So it's a great, uh, gr great startup there from New York. And uh, Spatia Land was another startup which was acquired by Walmart, uh, where again, we are talking the importance of contextual uh, information related to the products which you're interested in buying. So there were these uh, virtual assistants who would pop up and tell you more about the products and you know just enhance your shopping experience. Now, um, this is not just limited to FMCG or normal products. Like uh, Swarovski has this experience where, uh, and this was done in conjunction with MasterCard, where you could get into these luxurious environments and then buy the, the, uh, your favorite crystal products, like you get into this beautiful place. Now imagine you don't really have to invest in these places. You just have to invest in the 3D uh, environment and make it very interesting. And then imagine you, you going and buying this, looking at the product the way it fits in the real context. Uh, so that, that was another successful application uh, in retail. Now, um, immersive art, you, you might, think that is VR a technology, is it only related to mainstream industries, but art itself is a huge industry. Like if you know, uh, traditional art is a huge industry, but immersive art is the next paradigm in art. So uh, I think that I'll skip this slide first because first this has a platform. audio, but a gallery, let's, let's just play a few clips of it. Of interactive art anywhere in the world. Launching with three of the world's leading contemporary artists, our job is to constantly rethink virtual reality, bringing together brilliant minds with the latest technologies. So, so essentially, they are creating immersive art environments for getting you the same experience while sitting at home. So you can experience complete art galleries, walk through them, and see some immersive art installation. Same with Magic Gallery, again in California, where you can... Uh, it, here it's the other case where you walk into an art gallery, but the art pieces which are kept there are in virtual reality. So there you, uh, you don't do this while sitting at home or in office. You go there and experience different art installations, but each of them is in virtual reality. So even the way art galleries are uh, managed or the, the way the art galleries are presented is going to change. Uh, the same with some other installations like visionary art. Visionary art is, uh, has these unlimited possibilities when, when you integrate virtual reality environments with it. So th th these are some examples which, which have made, been very successful. Now let's talk about automotive. Again, a mainstream application. You might be having a lot of automotive clients uh, who, who, where this could be a future application. There are some case studies like the Ford's industrial athletes. The, the people or the technicians who work on your automobiles, they, uh, it's expected by the production staff or the production management that they, they get trained in a real world sense. Like the simulation should be as close as the real world. So what they have done is they have, they've used neurofeedback, haptic feedback sensors, and uh, they can actually simulate how it will, uh, how it takes for different parts of an automobile to be integrated together. And, and this simulation has really helped in making sure that they are trained or, or, or sort of uh, trained one level before getting into the field. So that has, like Industrial Athletes Project has really helped people understand before getting actually into the field uh, on how to make this uh, really feasible for the new stuff. At the same time, uh, everyone knows about uh, retail or marketing applications of VR in the automobile sector. Uh, it's not just the Toyota CHR VR experience, but a lot of other companies like Volvo and Nissan have employed this. Uh, you don't need all the cars in the showroom anymore. All you need is probably one or just a, just a chair. You sit into the chair, and I had myself seen this experience with Volvo where I just sit in the chair and the car gets built around you. 
piece by piece, right from the engine, then the interiors, then the everything just gets built around you. And then you can change the exterior, the interior, the way you want. You, everything is right there. And just imagine how many showrooms can you open. There's no limit to the number of showrooms can you open. And you can do it, tie it up with e-commerce, where you can have this even sitting anywhere. Uh, same with uh, Volkswagen, they, they really reduced their training expenses by making these 3D walkthroughs and simulations which were run across the global team. So they made this experience and uh, all their staff across the globe could experience a 3D workshop by just getting into it than actually going to the physical place because they have limited factories all over the world but they want to train as many people as possible in the global level. So that was another great exper experiment using the HTC Vive. Uh, let's talk a bit about how VR is transforming workspaces. Again, why are we working on a laptop? Why are we working on a flat screen when you have something like break room? In break room, Imagine everyone becomes the next digital nomad. I know you're bored of your cubicle. Define your workspace, define your uh, desktop in any 3D environment you want. Like just, it could be a savanna in Africa or it could be a beach and you're sitting and working the same way you would, but it's all over and you're sitting in some beautiful environment. So that's what Break Room is trying to do, redefine how you generally work with your workspace. Uh, same way Bloomberg did this experiment, like you've seen those stock traders, how the screens and the monitors are placed all over. You don't need to invest in all that anymore because all you need is a headset and you have all your stock information uh, cascaded, shown properly around you. So that's another way of redefining your workspace. Uh, now, this is my last case study example, but this is the most interesting. A lot of people talked about blockchain today. Decentraland, the ones who don't know, believe it or not, it is a complete virtual reality environment based on the Ethereum blockchain, where you can buy virtual assets trade virtual assets, make your own virtual environments and your virtual properties, and trade using ethers. So if you have any ethers on you, you can start having your own land in decentral land. You can have your own plots, you can have your own properties, and this is gonna be the future. It, it sounds a bit, bit mind-boggling, but people are trading on decentral land already. And it's completely backed by the Ethereum blockchain, so that's the future. That's really the future. I hope this was very interesting for you. Uh, what's next? I completely leave it to your imagination. I'm, I'm very uh, fortunate we still have four minutes. A uh, little bit about myself. We create interactive applications like we using, often using AR and VR for events and exhibitions in UAE and in other uh, GCC countries. So we create these interactive engagements currently for, uh, for consumer engagement, visitor engagement at events, and at the same time even for employee engagement in corporates. So VR is just the starting point we are working on, but as I see there are tremendous applications through my presentation which you saw, and I hope it was a great one. I'm open to any questions. Uh, any questions in VR, AR, MR, XR, I'll be happy to answer with my limited knowledge. Hi, Badal. I was just wondering, uh, you know, I recently even brought Oculus Quest. Uh, the headsets evolution is happening, of course. Where do you see the next evolution for headsets? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, that's what the industry probably is struggling on right now. The headsets are quite geared up to gamers and real enthusiasts. Uh, Google Daydream was a good, uh, good comfortable headset which uh, which makes use of your Android phones, and, and it's very comfortable. At the same time, Oculus Go has, uh, has been another headset which is very comfortable and at an affordable price point. But uh, if Apple does come up with their next AR glasses, or uh, once it becomes productized to a level where a normal mainstream customer can afford it, that's when the content revolution will take place. There are a lot of companies doing content, but I would say, in my wildest guess, it would be maybe two or three years in which you'll have a consumer level headset and where everyone can start uh, making the best use of these technologies. Thank you. Um, 
That was a very good presentation. I Thank love you. presentations with case studies. I have a question. I just want to want your thought on that. So there's this company in India called Lenskart. They started off with this, you know, uh, virtual uh, way of trying out or augmented reality way of trying out glasses. It sounded fascinating and they were doing well. And then I suddenly started seeing all these lens cut uh, showrooms across the city. I mean, is that because, you know, virtual did not work, people still wanted to try it. I mean, that's the way usually we do it, right? We go, we try. But then there was this breakthrough technology, but they were not able to sustain with just that technology. There were shops opened up everywhere. That goes for even Carrot Lane, which is trying, you know, selling online jewelry. They have all these try it out in AR. But then again, there are shops everywhere. So is, is it just a go-to-market strategy and then they actually get into the real retail uh, kind of a model? Uh, what's your sense? Well, with, uh, I, I think with physical products, there will always be a majority segment of customers who are the touch and feel type, who really want to go to the shop and who want to sense how it feels or try out. I mean, there are these virtual try-on mirrors where uh, the, it just augments the clothes on you. But uh, you're right in a way that it's, it's definitely a great go-to-market strategy. It's a great marketing tool. Before me going, driving all the way to the, to the optic shop, why don't I try it on my iPad, is, is always a better strategy. I can at least shortlist a few frames, go there, save my time. So in terms of marketing, but there's also a segment of customers who don't want to get into the hassle of going to the bricks and mortar store. And they definitely can just try out whatever they can or go into virtual stores and do shopping out there. So it's a changing landscape. Uh, since your question is only focused at retail, I think it's always going to be a mix uh, of, of people who prefer totally uh, virtual oriented shopping versus touch and feel shopping. So I think it's going to be a mix. OK. Anyone else? I, I don't have any prize, but anyone else with any questions? I have knowledge to share. <laughs> Just make it super quick, please. My question is, oh, sorry. Uh, my question is actually, when do we uh, transition from our current state to uh, the beam me up Scotty type scenario in Star Trek? I mean, today we uh, are. Can, can you be, be a little louder? From from your current state to a. Uh, Beat me up, Scotty. No, no, no. Beat me up, Scotty. <laughs> I'm, I'm using a Star Trek reference, actually. Okay, yeah, of course. Um, yeah. it, w it was a room, basically, you stepped in, and it just changed, and you went into that environment. So today, holograms are being utilized to this effect. When do we actually get to a point where we're actually stepping into the room and stepping into this environment where it's something completely different? Well, uh, that's that's pretty much sci-fi. Uh, I'm uh, like <laughs> AR, VR, uh, XR is one step about uh, like before it. Uh, holograms are still evolving. Uh, you could say holograms are a type of augmented reality, of course. But uh, nowadays, the biggest innovation in holograms are these holographic fans, where you don't see the blades of the fans, but you see a 3D object pop out. But it's still a physical fan. There are volumetric projection holograms, where uh, like you've seen celebrities who are dead, who can uh, who can be a little far away from you. So if if I am not here, actually, uh, I there could be still my hologram talking to you here. But for that, there is some projection technologies. So you can't really have someone else appear here in a hologram as yet, because technology hasn't evolved to that extent. Of course, if you wear the HoloLens, if you wear the Microsoft HoloLens, in fact, we are doing a project like that where you wear the HoloLens and you'll see a whole road come in front of you. So if you wear these high-end uh, AR glasses, you can possibly have anything and any I mean, literally, you can immerse yourself into any environment, and you can have it multi-user. So everyone else around you could be seeing a virtual environment pop up in front of them. The the limitation these days uh, with even the HoloLens 2 or the Magic Leap, which are the leading AR headsets, uh, the field of view is very limited. So it's not like your whole reality gets transformed. Uh, uh, like a small portion of it gets transformed. But we are getting there. With glasses, we can go and uh, say, beat me up, Scotty, for sure. So thank you very much. That's my time. Thank you so much. And hope it was great for you. Thank you very much for that, Dixie, founder of PearlQuest Interactive. Thank you so much. I hope